All right. So today we are going to talk about oral myofunctional disorders and how these issues are also seen in infants and toddlers. So I am Joy Lance. Thanks again for having me. I've been a dental hygienist since 1998. Um, I've been doing myofunctional therapy since 2016. And I started seeing a lot of babies with the office that I work in. So I decided to go back and get my breastfeeding certificate. So I started with my certified breastfeeding specialist. And then I went on to get my IBCLC, which is the International Board Certified Lactation Consultant. So I got that last year. So today, what I really want to talk about is how the ADA and the AAPD, which is the Academy of Pediatric Dentistry, um, they recommend that um, the first dental visit should be occurring within six months after the baby's first tooth appears, but no child's first birthday. I'm also going to talk about the dental professional's role in seeing patients starting at infancy. Um, and I'm going to describe what early intervention in a dental office could look like. So myofunctional disorders in infants, toddlers, and even beyond, you know, children, adults, basically what these disorders are, are improper patterning with your oral musculature. So when you're not using your muscles the right way, that's going to interfere with normal growth, development, and function of your entire facial complex. So as we were talking about knowing what the root cause, we have a lot of kids that are coming into our offices and we're seeing a lot of these things, cavities, mouth breathing, um, allergies, high narrow palate. And if you're not really aware of the why this is happening, then it just kind of gets maybe put in the chart and you put set them up for their six month recall. But when we really get down to the root cause of these issues, most of them are from myofunctional health. So poor posture, interrupted sleep, chewing and swallowing patterns that aren't ideal, disordered breathing, restricted tongue mobility. These are the root causes that are going to cause all of these problems with our children. So when we have these kids in our office and we're able to screen for these things, we can help kids and parents navigate a lot easier through the things up on the top. So typically with myofunctional therapy, I we wait, you know, it, you wait until they're four years old. Typically, programs start once kids are able to, you know, follow directions and understand what you're trying to teach them. Granted, at four years old, it's not always easy there either. You have to kind of modify things and learn how to be fun and break things down. But traditional myofunctional therapy where you're assigning exercises starts around four. However, Infants and toddlers have a lot of issues too. So all of these problems don't just magically start when they're four. You know, these are issues that these kids are having in utero and then they're being born with and then it's persisting. And if we're not recognizing, recognizing these things, then we're not able to help them. They just kind of are suffering through to get to where they need to be. So if you look at these pictures, you know, you can see the, the lips and the facial tension and how they are just, they don't have good oral rest posture. And that's one big tenant of myofunctional therapy. When we're looking at these kiddos, we can see now granted the one picture, the child has a lip tie, but that is morphing how that palette looks. And then the other photo is a high palette from a pacifier use. And then we see things like recessed jaws. We see things like coated tongues. So all of these are clues into what's happening within their mouth. And these are things that we can screen for and help parents through in our dental offices. So the dental profession is responsible for the prevention, diagnosis, and treatment of diseases and disorders of the oral cavity and related structures. So it's really not just about teeth. I think that's where we kind of get stuck. You know, the babies don't have teeth. It doesn't matter. You know, the habits and the things that they're doing 
are going to affect and directly correlate with what their oral structure looks like and how they are growing. So all that is our responsibility to track and help treat as early as possible. So that's the goal today is to talk about those kind of things. So when we are seeing little, little kids, infants, there are really early signs that we can talk to parents about that are going to give us big clues into them having myofunctional problems. So when we have infants in our office and they're having problems, breast or bottle feeding, infants can have ties, not just tongue ties, they can have cheek ties, they can have lip ties. All of those are typically going to affect um, how they're able to hold on to their bottle or the breast. Pacifier use. Now we know babies are going to use pacifiers, but we don't want them on pacifiers until they're three or four years old. When we see toddlers, typically the issues that we see, um, they can have issues transitioning into solid foods. Um, they can be gagging, choking. A lot of times they will come in with sleep problems. So my goal is to really have early intervention with these children to screen them, educate the parents, do what we can do within the dental office, but then refer them out if needed to really set them up for better growth and development instead of waiting. So what really causes these disorders? What makes these disorders happen? Um, again, it can be habits or conditions. So habits are gonna be more our thumb suckers, finger suckers, conditions are gonna be structural issues. So we're gonna go over the three most common causes of myofunctional disorders. So again, we have oral habits. So if we have thumb suckers, finger suckers, um, kids that really are licking their lips, chewing at their lips, biting their nails, chewing on the collars of their shirts, um, these are habits. Um, oral ties are more of a structural thing. So when we have a tongue tie that looks like that and it's tied to the tip of the tongue, that infant is not going to be able to lift their tongue to be able to eat properly. They're not going to be able to lift their tongue into their palate to help that palate grow properly. And that leads to just a cascade then a domino effect of issues that are going to come. And then the last thing is airway issues. So kids can have obstruction, enlarged tonsils, adenoids. Sometimes they have allergies. Sometimes these kids literally just don't know how to blow their nose, which is kind of crazy, but that's always my first line of defense with kids is keeping their nose clear. We can't have kids that are nose breathing if they're walking around with a snotty, stuffy nose. So nasal hygiene has got to be number one for kids and parents to learn. So let, we're going to dive a little bit deeper into these causes. So oral habits such as, you know, and it doesn't matter. Sometimes I have adults that come in that are doing these things, but this goes all the way back even to infants and toddlers. So thumb sucking. We've seen scans of kids sucking their thumb in utero on ultrasound pictures. Um, as they get older, we can have finger sucking, clenching and grinding, um, tongue sucking, which some of these things can be really challenging. And then understanding again, what the root cause, like why are they doing these things? So when we have kids come into our office and we are seeing their teeth ground down like this, we know that something else is happening. We know that this child is likely grinding because they're having issues sleeping. And the other thing we're gonna look at is, it's kind of hard to see on this picture, but he looks like he has a really narrow palate. And you can tell that because his teeth are so close together. So these are his baby teeth and they are tight in that jaw. So it's not gonna leave enough room for our adult teeth. It's not gonna leave enough room for palate growth. And then we're not gonna have those nice big airways that we need to breathe well. Plus with grinding, it causes imbalances in muscles. Even young kids have pain and jaw issues. And we're gonna see that in one of my patients coming up later. Issues that happen with kids are like we talked about extended pacifier use. We know that, you know, sometimes kids need to suck to soothe themselves, but once we're using pacifiers really past one year old, that is not for the child to soothe themselves anymore. That's more of a habit or it's actually for the parents. Um, Long-term sippy cup use, sippy cups with very hard spouts tend to hold 
of the mouth, and that's not really a proper swallowing pattern. So if they're trapping that tongue, they never really use learn how to use their tongue properly for their swallow. The other thing is kids can be really picky eaters and they prefer to just snack on soft foods or eat out of pouches. Those kind of things are going to not, not help us with our muscular development that we need. So we really need to be chewing on foods and having full range of motion with our tongue to move that food around and have the musculature strength to chew the food. So when we have kids that are just eating soft foods and slurping things up out of pouches, that's not going to foster that muscle growth that we need. So this is one of our patients who was um, one, still on a pacifier. She was on a soothing pacifier, which is one of the harder silicone pacifiers. So it's really important to teach parents the difference between pacifiers too, which is fully in dental hygiene scope, talking to parents about pacifiers and weaning. And they need to understand that if they are using the quote unquote incorrect shape pacifier, it, your palate, these kids' palates will shape around the pacifier. So that's exactly what happened with this little girl. She had the soothing pacifier in her mouth all the time. And you can literally see the shape of the soothing pacifier nipple in her palate. You can see she's got that V-shaped palate. It's not growing really wide. And you can see those teeth are really close together. Again, the other thing about pacifiers is it's going to hold the tongue on the floor of the mouth. When the tongue is always on the floor of the mouth, it does not help the palate grow wide like we need it to. It causes this narrow V-shaped growth, which is going to then again have that domino effect with teeth and airway structure and all the things that we're going to have to reverse then when these kids are older. The next thing we're going to talk about is structural issues. Obviously, if we have children with oral ties, that is going to be a structural restriction where they are not going to be able to function properly with their muscles. So they are going to have to compensate with other muscles to be able to do the things that they need to do, such as eat properly. So again, this is our our little kiddo, who's obviously an infant, his tie is tip of his tongue all the way to that alveolar ridge. So um, this baby is not going to be able to eat properly. It really doesn't matter if he's bottle fed or breast fed. Babies need to be able to lift their tongue up to their palates to really get a good latch or seal on the bottle. And there's no way with this restriction that this baby is going to be able to do that. We also know, again, with tongue ties, they're not able to get their tongue up to their palate, so their tongue is going to be resting in the floor of their mouth. They get older, it's going to lead to thrusting, jaw pain, sleep issues, and these are all things that we talk to parents about when they're coming into the office. And then the last cause is obstructed breathing. So it can be from all kinds of different things. Restrictions in the airways from enlarged tonsils or adenoids. It can be from deviated septums. It can be from allergies, or it simply can be just from a habitual thing like we talked about. If a kid, we've seen so many kids that are just habitual mouth breathers because they're nose breathers and then they get a cold and they suddenly forget that they're able to go back and breathe through their nose again. So this is one of our patients that we had in. Yeah. You can see how large his tonsils are. That's going to be a really big problem for him. It's going to obviously blocking his airway. It's causing mouth breathing. It's, you know, and that's a debate. We don't know if it's large tonsils are causing the mouth breathing or if the mouth breathing is causing large tonsils, but either way, he's having trouble breathing. He's not sleeping well. These are the kids that have dark circles under their eyes. Um, and these sometimes are kids that have feeding problems too. You know, if you look at the size of the back of his throat, how is he going to be able to really chew anything and swallow it properly? These, a lot of times are the kids that prefer softer foods that are easy to just get passed down their throat. 
Again, if you look at his teeth, you can see those baby teeth are really close together. That's another clue that we know that that mouth isn't really growing properly and he's gonna have a lot of restriction when his adult teeth start to come in. So I wanted to go over really quickly, if you are seeing infants and toddlers, younger patients in your office, what kind of things are you going to be able to spot in your younger patients? And a lot of times we talk about normal versus common. So just because it's common doesn't mean it's normal. So keep that in mind when we're looking at these pictures and kind of going through these symptoms. Okay. So what are you going to be looking for in infants? I think you have the wheelbarrow. Is that right? I was going to. So again, we have kids who have improper lip posture baby is pursing her lips is this normal or common for her this is her normal this is she's holding a lot of tension in her face and this is how she holds her face so we know that this is not good lip posture she's going to tense up all those muscles and be really tight your mom's got to listen to something for recess jaws and babies is this normal or common so babies are born with recessed jaws. So this can be normal in the beginning. Um, baby's jaws typically start to grow forward between 10 and 16 weeks old. We'll start to see that jaw come forward. Sometimes in our office, when we have kids who have really severe tongue ties, their jaws are not growing forward from that restriction. Coated tongue, is this normal or common? We see this with a lot of our babies. So what's happening with this is if you look at this tongue, you can see the front part of the tongue is pink. And then there's this delineation in the middle of the tongue and on the back two thirds of the tongue, it's totally white. That usually is the indication where the tongue tie is attached underneath the tongue. So it's showing us the range of motion that the tongue has. The front third of the tongue has really good range of motion. They're able to lift that part of their tongue to get it up to the palate, to self-clean it up on that palate. The back part of the tongue cannot reach the palate. So that palate is probably a little bit higher in the back and they can't lift that part of the tongue to get it up to the palate to clean. So then the milk or the formula just sits on the tongue and it coats the tongue. Again, we have our buddy with his facial tension. He's just pursing his lips. You can also see on this guy, he if you look at his lips, those are called cobblestone lips. So he kind of has a, a two-tone. The inner layer is very um, blistered and that gives us clues to him really overusing his lips to try and eat. When babies eat, your lips should be very passive and just kind of holding the seal and not being used but this little guy was tongue tied. So what happens is he overuses not only his lips, but now you can see the tension in his cheeks and in his chin to help get the seal. And then this is just now his resting posture. Again, we know about high palates. We don't want high palates. We want nice wide, low palates. So kids have lots of room in their mouth which equals lots of room in their airway. And this is gonna just help them breathe better and have lots of space for their teeth and have great craniofacial development, which is what we want for our kids. Here's another really good example of lip blisters. So again, sometimes kids, when they're overusing those lips to try and eat because they can't use their tongue enough, you're going to see these little blisters in the middle of their lip from the friction of them trying to hold on to the breast or the bottle nipple with their lips instead of using their tongue properly. There are gonna be some things that you're gonna be able to notice in both infants and toddlers. So we're gonna talk about those. Snoring is a huge one. You know, a lot of parents don't realize what a big issue snoring is. They think it's cute. They'll post pictures of their kids, but it is really not normal. And it's something that we need to help parents understand and really dig deeper into. Uh, there's a lot of studies out there that by um, having sleep disordered breathing in children, 
that is going to affect their cognitive abilities. And that is something that is going to stay with them for their entire life. So if they're not sleeping well, they're not getting enough oxygen while they're sleeping. It, it's going to affect their, their cognition, which it, that's huge. So we really need to start talking to parents about snoring and figuring out why they are snoring and help them get better early. Mouth breathing. This is my little guy before I knew better. He's 20 now. And looking back at pictures, I can see, you know, every picture we took, he I is breathing through his mouth, his mouth wide open. So we want to be paying my attention. Face. This is something that can be hard. Parents don't understand all the time what mouth breathing, why it's bad, what it means. And they don't even, they're not even paying attention to see if their kids are mouth breathers. They are, they'll come into the office and I'll say, is your child a mouth or a nose breather? And they'll say nose breather. And then I'm watching the baby the whole time they're there and they're mouth breathing. So again, this can be common, but it doesn't necessarily mean it's normal. We talked about oral habits. So we know these kids can have all kinds of oral habits. Again, you know, infants are going to use pacifiers to self-soothe. There are studies out there that say it, it helps with um, SIDS. So I'm not saying we need to take pacifiers away. We just need to be very mindful and really help um, instruct parents on a good weaning schedule, understanding what they're using the pacifier for. Zero to six months is really good for um soothing and making sure that we're telling them what brand of pacifiers or what type of pacifiers to use so it's not going to affect their palates. Typically from six to 12 months, we recommend using it just for sleep times and starting to wean right at that 12 month. If we're using pacifiers or sucking thumbs after 12 months, we need to look into the why. Why is that happening? Um, again, we saw the, the photos that these oral habits, depending on what we're doing, if it's thumb sucking, if it's pacifiers, whatever it is, if it's too long, there's usually a reason why. Drooling. This is another one. We have lots of kids that come in that have poor oral rest posture, meaning their tongue is sitting on the floor of their mouth. They don't have really good musculature in their cheeks, so their masseters are really weak, and their mouths are just wide open, hanging open, and they're just drooling all over themselves. So if they're teething, that's different, but excessive drooling all the time for going through lots of bibs throughout the day, that's telling us that they're not able to sustain that good oral rest posture. Ear infections and ear tubes. This is a really, really big one we hear in our office all the time. If we have kids that come in with really chronic ear infections where they're getting ear infections all the time, that's usually an indication that they are having issues swallowing. So the structure of the ear tubes is totally different between infants and kids and adults, the, the shape of the tubes and how they're um, placed. And if you're not swallowing properly, you don't have the suction to really clear the fluid out of your tubes and it's going to back up and you're going to continue to get infections. So making sure to look at these kids, not only for oral restrictions, but if they're able to get the back part of their tongue up to the palate, that's going to be something we'll want to look for. All right, moving on to things that we're just going to see in toddlers. What kind of things are we going to see in these little guys? So sometimes it looks like these kids have really big tongues and usually it's not a big tongue. It's that their jaws aren't growing enough to accommodate the tongue in their mouth. So if we look at this picture of this little guy, again, we want that really generous spacing in between those baby teeth. And looking at this picture and evaluating him, you can see he does not have that space. So there are offices out there, ours is included. We start expansion very early in children. Um, we introduce tools to help those jaws grow. Um, and we are really on top of things very early to help things grow more naturally and have those interventions early so we can guide the growth instead of waiting for the growth to stop and then fixing things. <laughs> Again, looking at these big tonsils, when we have mouth breathers, tonsils are big. If we have inflammation in our body, tonsils are big. 
I know there's a lot of controversy out there. We don't know what came first, the chicken or the egg. It doesn't really matter if these kids have big tonsils and this guy has a small mouth. We either send the ENTs, we start some kind of expansion. We have to help this kid because likely, more likely than not, he's not really sleeping well either. No, I'm listening. I your eyes closed. They are, but I'm listening. Oh. Allergic shiners. This is a big one that you're going to see in your kids who are not sleeping well or not having good craniofacial development. So if that maxilla is not moving forward, you're going to see these dark circles under kids' eyes. Um, and again, this is just another sign of normal versus common. We probably see it a lot and it's, it's not normal. We need to help these kids with their sleep and with their growth. And increase in cavities. So when we see toddlers in, which we just had one last week that, you know, needs silver diamine fluoride on every single tooth to help him keep the teeth that he has to help him chew and sustain the teeth in his mouth. I mean, being a 15 month old and already having cavities on every tooth, something else is happening. So we're trying to educate the parents on why are they having the caries? What, what is happening in their diet? What is happening with their mouth breathing? You know, get to the root cause of why this is happening so we can help keep the caries. Oh, why are you watching on your phone? Malocclusion. So you're going to see one of my case studies coming up and you're going to see how this girl just evolved and had a really deep bite, really big overbite, tipping of the teeth. When we have our kids, we need to be looking for the good spacing. And like I said, just really being able to intervene with, with tools before they are too old. I guess it's never too old, but the earlier, the better, the earlier we can help these kids, they're going to eat better. They're going to sleep better. They're going to breathe better. And that's just going to, they're going to thrive more than open bite. So this is going to be something we see a lot. Uh, this patient was a thumb sucker of mine. So she was sucking her thumb. She was eight years old, still sucking her thumb. So when you see open bites, you definitely want to ask about habits. You definitely want to ask about or check their swallowing in the office, um, see if they're thrusting their tongue, see if they have any oral ties. But we know open bites are not normal. However, we have patients that will continue to be in orthodontics over and over and over again because we did not address the root cause of the tongue. So our orthodontic patients continue to go through more so because of relapse. And then jaw growth, you know, when we're checking jaws and toddlers and, and children, we want to make sure that those jaws aren't staying recessed like we saw in the babies. So like we said, recessed jaws in babies is normal, um, but that jaw should start growing forward between 10 and 16 weeks old. So obviously this is a little girl. She is way past that. She still has a very recessed jaw. This is going to give you a clue that her mouth is going to be very small. And it was small. She had grade four tonsils. She had stainless steel, stainless steel crowns throughout her mouth. So that just tells us it's a little piece of the puzzle as to what's going on. Have the kids that are sleeping all over the place. Sometimes parents will come in and say their kids wake up and they're sleeping on the floor or they toss and turn all over the bed or they're sleeping with their head extended back. Um, we use a really extensive questionnaire out of Sharon Moore's book, Sleep Wrecked Kids. Um, we wanna know how these kids are sleeping because of those cognitive issues that we know they're gonna have if they're not sleeping well. Even if their room, they're in their room and they're in bed all night sleeping, if they're all over the place or extending their head back trying to breathe, we know that they might not be getting the best sleep. So mm -hmm. we need to ask more in-depth questions. So why should dental professionals care about myofunctional disorders in kids? And in my opinion, I think if we are able to intervene early enough, we have the gift to be able to get them back on the right track. We can help them earlier. Like I said, we shouldn't be waiting for orthodontic intervention uh, until, you know, teenage years when we can really get them early grow those jaws, open everything up and help the domino effect go the positive direction. 
So how are these myofunctional disorders going to affect infants? A lot of times when I see infants who have really high palates for whatever reason, if it's from tongue ties or pacifier use or thumb use, it's going to affect their breathing. They're not going to be able to breathe through their nose very well because the palate is very high, taking up space in that nasal area. Um, so they always sound congested. They always sound like they have mucus stuck in their nose. And sometimes moms are just suctioning noses out all day long and there's nothing to suction out. It's just from their structure. That's going to lead the kids to mouth breathe. So that's not what we want for the, even for the babies. Um, a lot of these babies have issues bottle or breastfeeding. Like I said, if they have certain issues, they can't use their tongue or lift their tongue. They're going to be clicking. They're going to be leaking milk out of their mouth. They're going to be really colicky or having reflux from swallowing so much air. Um, and it can be really challenging for parents because this seems it's just nonstop. So we went over what to look for. That's, that's not it's not normal for them not to be able to bother or breastfeed. They know intuitively what they're supposed to do when they're born. And then we have the infants that have big issues transitioning to solids. Um, may got through bottle feeding or breastfeeding fine, and now it's time to transition into solid food and they can't tolerate it. It's not normal for an infant to not be able to transition into solid foods by nine months old. Um, when they're gagging and choking due to a really hypersensitive palate or tongue tie, that's when we need to, you know, really start looking at oral ties, making connections with our speech language pathologist for feeding therapy and knowing how to help these kids to get to the next level, proper development. And then of course, sleeping. So we talked about all the things with sleeping, moving around, snoring, making noises, head extended back. That's going to warrant a referral out to help them sleep better. And how do these disorders affect toddlers? So again, it's going to be the same thing with breathing. If they're stuffy and their nose is restricted, they're going to automatically be a mouth breather. It can affect their speaking. If you can't use your tongue properly, it's going to affect either um, a delay in sounds and words, which we've seen before, or um, distortion in sounds, you know, so that's when we're going to help bring in our speech therapists to be able to help these kids with their sound production. Again, we have toddlers come in all the time that are still bottle feeding, breastfeeding, dependent on that for their calories instead of solid food, which at, at that age is not normal um, and issue sleeping. So for our office, when we are screening patients, these are two big things that we are doing. We have a really good parent intake. So we're asking detailed questions to our intake form so we can really streamline gathering information. It's good to send parents the intake while they're at home. So when we're asking questions about sleep, they can take a minute to, to monitor what their kid are doing. Um, they're not always watching their kids sleep, so they don't always know what's happening. And then, of course, when they come into the office, we're going to be doing an in-office screening. So we're going to take a deep dive into the intake information, and then we're going to have either additional supportive questions from what the intake says, and then we're going to be checking intraorally for all the things that we saw, such as high palates, tethered oral tissues, what their teeth look like once they're erupted. That's what we're going to be checking for in office. So for our intake information for our infants, these are some of the overarching topics that we talk about. So we want to know, again, if they're nasal breathers or mouth breathers, which again can be a tricky one. Parents aren't really paying attention to that. They might not know. Um, how are they eating? You want to know if they're having issues with breastfeeding, bottle feeding, or transitioning to solid foods, because as we saw, that can be all issues with your oral musculature or structural issues. We want to know about nursing symptoms for mom. If mom is having pain or issues such as um, their breast not being emptied after the baby eats, that's going to give us really big clues into functional issues in the baby's mouth. They might be getting too tired and not be able to empty their mother all the way. And that's going to really impact their milk supply. And that is when things really get tricky. 
Again, intake information for infants, we want to know, are these babies snoring, tossing and turning, um, all the things that are Im improper for sleeping. These are going to point to a sleep disorder, so we'll have to dive a little bit deeper into that. When we're talking about toddlers, a lot of it is the same. Obviously, breathing is for everybody. Everybody should be nasal breathers. So that's what we're going to talk to parents about when they come in. We're going to talk to parents with toddlers about their eating habits. What kind of foods are they eating? Are they picky eaters? Remember the kids, they like the soft foods or things that are easy to swallow. Are they messy eaters where they're putting food in their mouth and their mouths are wide open because they're mouth breathers? So food is just getting all over the place. Um, we want to know if they are cup drinking, straw drinking, sippy cup drinking. So we ask about all the, the eating questions. We also want to know about speaking. Once they start talking, we want to know if there's issues with certain sounds. First, we want to know that they're starting talking. That's the first thing. But if kids have issues with certain sounds, so when you say L's or N's, we're using the front part of our tongue. Where when you're saying R's and S's, we're using the back part of our tongue. So a lot of times we'll have kids who are having trouble with these sounds, and it could be that they need speech therapy, but it also could be an issue with a tie or the posterior part of their tongue, and they're not able to lift that part up, so then the sound comes out distorted. And again, at the same thing with toddlers, we want to ask all the same questions, snoring, tossing, turning, sleep talking, sleep, sleep walking. Um, and that's not always questions that are forthcoming. You really have to ask the parents these things and have it on a yes or no questionnaire because it might not be something parents are necessarily thinking about at the forefront of their mind. So obviously our intakes are a little bit different for babies and for toddlers. So in our office, this is just part of our questions that we go through with infants. So we want to know what the baby symptoms are. And typically all of these are going to give us clues as to what's happening in the baby's okay. mouth. So if the babies are having issues, for instance, saying sliding off the nipple when they attempt to latch, that tells me that they're not getting enough of the nipple in their mouth and they're just don't have the musculature to hold on and be able to sustain a full feed. We also ask about mom symptoms. We want to know, is mom having any bruising or bleeding? Um, is she having pain when the baby starts to latch? Is she having mastitis? Is she having issues where the baby can't fully empty her breast? Again, those are all going to be symptoms that we track when the baby comes in, and then we screen them to see if they need any releases or any other supports, and then we screen them for post-op information as well to make sure that these symptoms that they're having when they come in are getting better when they're finished with us. The toddler intake is a little bit more, because there's more of a history usually to take, so um, if toddlers are not nursing or bottle feeding anymore, we still want to know the history. We want to know if parents had issues with those things in the past. We want to know if they had feeding problems. You know, again, did they have problems transitioning from breastfeeding or bottle feeding into food? Did they have issues with different types of food? Sometimes we'll have babies that come in that have no problems with purees because those are soft and they can just swallow them. But then when it comes to eating solid foods, they have a hard time either manipulating the food around their mouth, they have a hard time keeping their mouth closed to keep the food in their mouth, or they can be gagging or choking on the food. So those are all things that we're going to want to know. Um, we want to know if they're going to have any speech problems. So we ask about specific sounds. We want to know if they're in speech therapy. We want to know how long, how, who they're working with so we can collaborate with them. And then we ask all of our questions about their sleeping issues. We want to know what's happening in their sleep. So then if there's red flags, we can target those things, see what we can see, and then refer out if needed. So when we're talking about breathing and sleeping, you know, why, why does this matter? How is this going to impact the child's oral health? We have the baby on the, on the bigger picture with, you know, their mouth open and this isn't really obvious. It's not a wide open gaping mouth, but it's open enough that it's going to cause problems as opposed to the baby in the bottom who's got their lips closed and together, which is what we want to see. And how this is going to impact them is it's going to contribute to what we've seen, malaligned teeth, not having spacing between the teeth, 
when we don't have our tongue up, it's going to change the shape of our face and our mouth. It's going to cause kids to form more of a long face. And then we know in this group that it's going to change the pH of their mouth. It's going to affect biofilm, increase caries risk, contribute to gingival inflammation. So if this is something that is going to stay with these babies, then what's going to happen when we get them as toddlers? These are going to be the toddlers that are coming in who are needing interventions already on brand new teeth that they're getting in their mouth. And then when it comes to bottles and pacifiers, you know, why in a dental office are we going to be talking to, to parents about bottles and pacifiers? How is this going to impact the child's oral health? And we've already seen, you know, it, it can contribute to tongue thrusting. It can contribute to malaligned teeth in the future because we know that if we're using pacifiers too long, it's going to affect the way the palate grows, which is going to affect the way that the teeth come in. So all of these are things that we should be talking about with our parents when they come in. There's also a giant list of things that we can be talking to parents about. So of course, when you have patients come in, you're gonna be reviewing their medical history, but knowing about their birth history can be really interesting too. If they had a really traumatic birth, um, if they had a long birth, if they had a vaginal birth versus a C-section, all of those can give you clues to things that are going on with the baby. Of course, you're going to ask pertinent questions having to do with breastfeeding, bottle feeding, pacifiers. How are they eating? What are they eating? What are their food choices? And how did they transition to solids? Um, those not only are going to give us information for things going on in their mouth, but it's going to give us information to know if we need to refer those kids out for additional support. In our office, we're going to be screening for tethered oral tissues. We screen for airway. We screen all children for movement. We know in our office that gross motor movement comes before fine motor movement. And fine motor movement is everything that goes on in your mouth. So if you are having delays in gross motor movement, things in your mouth are not going to be on track. Of course, we talk about sleep. We check posture. And we're looking at craniofacial development. Of course, we're documenting what we see. So every time we see these kids, we want to know, are they having delays in tooth eruption, asymmetries in their faces, oral and facial posture, postures, as we saw in the kids' um, pictures earlier. We know that, you know, not every baby has great oral rest posture. There are babies that have puckered faces and tight lips and, and things that aren't necessarily quote unquote normal. And we want to know what kind of preferences they have when it comes to um, different kind of pacifiers, all the different things that you're going to talk to parents about, because one thing is going to give you clues to another thing. Another thing we do in our office is we are very heavy on educating parents. We raise awareness. And when it comes to uh, our team and the parents, we are a team together. We work together. Um, just like when we have patients for recalls, we're really only seeing them for that little bit. And it might not be a full picture of what's really going on. Of course, we're going to talk to parents about what they should be expecting when it comes to sleep, when it comes to feeding, when it comes to movement, when it comes to dental development, when it, so they're prepared for all these things. Of course, we are, like I said, if we need through the screening, we refer out if needed, we're connecting parents to local providers that we've already kind of screened and we know uh, who are on our team and understand what we do. And then of course, we talk about oral habit development, why are we doing those things? And then we talk about habit elimination. So there's a lot of things that we can dive into with these kids. It's not just a, a kind of lost quick peek in the mouth and okay, there's your exam. So a couple screening tools that I feel are really um, helpful is the Bear Sleep Screening Tool. It's a really easy five item screening tool you can use for pediatric patients and you can start using this tool when the kids are two. Um, another thing sometimes I like to ask parents to do is take videos of their child sleeping, eating, talking. It's going to give you a more comprehensive picture and it's going to give you an opportunity to point things out to parents on the video that they might not have seen before and they might not understand is a really big problem. So this is the bear sleep screening. Again, you can start this at two and you can use this all the way up until 18 years of old. 
to 18 years old. So it's a really quick screening. You can do this in the office. You can give this to the patient to do ahead of time and then review it when they come in the office. This can give you a good idea into what is happening with the patient's sleep. And then once we have the patient in the office, of course, we're gonna be reviewing their entire intake information. So you're gonna go through all the paperwork and then we have our own checklist in the office that we're gonna be doing for our intraoral examination. A really big thing I wanna talk about is talking to parents about their, you know, a lot of times parents, um, they might bring issues to their pediatricians and they kind of, they aren't getting heard in other places. So once parents come in and they are having issues, make sure you have a little bit of time to really talk to them about what's happening because it's gonna make them have a much better experience and feel like they're being heard and listened to. Of course, throughout all the pictures that you've seen today, you know, these are the things that we're gonna be looking for. Palettes, tethered oral tissues. We wanna look at how the baby is resting, how, what is their oral resting posture? If we have teeth, what does our occlusion look like? And then oral function. So just to look quick at some of these photos, you know, the first photo, we have a nice wide palette. We have lots of room for our teeth coming in versus a narrow palette. So of course we want the wide palette. Looking for tethered oral tissues, this can be tricky. There's um, lots of scales that you can look up online. Um, to know where the, the attachment is on the tongue, where the attachment is in the floor of the mouth or on the ridges. There's all different kinds of gratings and they all look different. You know, some are posterior tongue ties, some are anterior tongue ties, some are way more obvious than the others, but I will tell you all of these pictures are tongue ties. So knowing what the tongue is supposed to do and how it's supposed to function is gonna give you another good idea to know if it's a tethered oral tissue because just because it has a string doesn't mean it's tied. Everyone has the frenum. We need to see what it's doing. Again, talking about oral rest posture. So the first photo, we have this with a lot of babies that are coming in where their mouth is wide open, their tongue is hanging out of their mouth. That is not ideal resting posture. Um, for the baby on the right, you can see he has horrible lip blisters on his lips. But if you look at his tongue, his tongue is resting up on the roof of his mouth. And ideally, he should have his lips closed as well. But of course, then you wouldn't be able to see it. So that was a really great example of what resting posture that we like looks like. And then occlusion. So, I mean, when we're looking at this little girl, we can see she's got a really deep overbite. She has tipping of all those teeth. Everything is just collapsing. That is not what we want to see when we look at kids' occlusion. And oral function. Oral function is huge. This is how we are able to eat, breathe, sleep, do all the things that we need to do. We need to be able to, in the first picture, move our tongue side to side. You can see our finger was in the in the side of the mouth and that baby's tongue is going to the side of the mouth. That's what we wanna see. Um, in the second picture, you can see the baby's tongue is lifting up. Again, that's what we want. We want good oral function. And then additional things that we're gonna make note of when we're seeing these babies, you know, is their tongue coated? Do they have lip blisters? Do they have tension in their face? You know, what kind of things are we seeing? Another big thing I look at with babies is their body posture. Body posture for us is huge. Uh, we lay every baby on their side on our lap to lap mat so we can see if they can comfortably lay their head on the mat. And you can see this baby could not lay his head down that much. He's on an angle and that is from the tension that he's holding in his neck. So when we have babies that come in that are holding this tension in their body, when this mom goes to either nurse or bottle feed this baby, but nursing more importantly, this is one of the positions this baby's gonna be in to feed. Do you think he's gonna feed well? He's really not, he's not comfortable. It doesn't feel good. And these are the babies that we screen and we send out to our body workers. So either physical therapist, we have um, chiropractors, we have craniosacral therapists, so we have a whole host of people that we refer out to to help these kids. So 
why am I so passionate about wanting to see these kids? You know, when you, we talk to other professionals, like it again, but pediatricians, a lot of times they just want to wait or they tell parents they'll just grow out of it. And my thing is, is the earlier we can get on things, the better we're going to avoid further problems. And we're not going to have all these issues that we're seeing with our patients. So looking in these mouths, we know that narrow palates are going to equal narrow airways. Obviously, if we're narrow in one spot, we're going to be narrow in another. That's not going to be good for kids to breathe or to sleep. Wide palates equal wide airways. Again, when we can set them up early and help guide their growth and open things up, it's going to give them a better quality of life. And that's really what we do. We are the prevention specialists. So we need to be on top of even infants and toddlers. This is a patient that we're looking at who had a tongue tie, didn't have it addressed. Now, granted, a lot of patients don't know these things, but look at her posture. Look at how forward her head posture is. That's going to cause neck and shoulder pain. If she would have had this addressed, if we knew better when she was younger, she wouldn't have had the issues that she has now. So when we're not addressing tethered oral tissues, we're not addressing oral rest posture, that's going to equal occlusion issues. You can see from this patient not having the tongue up in the palate, again, those posterior teeth, everything is tipping in, and we have an open bite. Look at the wear on those front teeth. Now he's got adult teeth that are erupted. I mean, we, we need to get on this way earlier than we are and get this taken care of. This is another same patient. Everything is tipped in, that open bite. It's because we're not looking at the root cause of why these things are happening. What about lack of mid-face growth because we don't have proper oral rest posture? So you can see how flat this girl's face is. That's because she hasn't had her maxilla grow forward. She does not have proper oral rest posture throughout her younger years. So that bone was not able to grow properly. And if her maxillas aren't growing properly, what's going to happen to the mandible? It's going to get trapped. And that's not going to be able to grow forward either. And when we're trapped back like this, we're not going to sleep well because we're not going to be able to breathe because everything is being shoved back in our mouths. Body posture. Now, granted, these aren't infants and toddlers, but these are kids. So if we have poor body posture in infants and toddlers, it's not just going to go away. They are going to hold that, that tension and they are going to present with that even as young children. And if it's not addressed as children, they're going to take it with them through adulthood. So we look at these pictures, her shoulders are off, her eyes are totally off. And this little guy is so far forward, his head isn't over his shoulder. So this is going to follow them if it's not addressed. What about forward head posture and TMJ issues from not releasing tethered oral tissues? We see this all the time. Tethered oral tissues make patients thrust. And a lot of times if we're thrusting for decades, it's going to cause jaw issues. It's going to cause jaw pain. And it's going to cause you to not have great forward, great posture. Your head's going to be forward. And you can tell in the sky who's 13. Like he's just, he needs help. And what about toddlers getting all their calories just from nursing because they can't eat, they don't want to eat. If you want to nurse your toddler forever, that's great. I totally believe in that. But I've had moms in the office who are crying because they both feel like they're ready to be done nursing, but they can't because their toddler can't eat anything. So they feel like they have to. That's the only way their child is going to get calories. So obviously, the earlier we screen, the earlier we can identify the problems. 
And the earlier we can identify the problems, then we're able to get on top of treating or referring to get these patients help. So I'm going to go through a few case studies. My first case study is Fiona, and she is four, so she's not necessarily considered a toddler, but I really want to talk about her case because it affected me a lot. And this was one of the cases that really showed me that a light switch does not go out when patients are four and all of these problems start happening. So you're going to see that with Fiona. So this is Fiona. She's adorable. I love her. She was a great patient, but look at all that tension in her face. Mom came to me because her main concern was dental issues and sleep issues. So this is what mom told me through the intake. She is mouth breathing all the day, all day and night. She has allergies. She still sleeps with mom. So mom knows that she's snoring and she's up in the middle of the night, one to two times a night. And of course we saw she has an overbite and an overjug. So I did a myofunctional evaluation on her. There was a lot of things going on, but these are the big things that I want you to take note of. Mouth breathing for Fiona was more habitual. She did not have anything that we could see in her mouth. She was still sent to an ENT because her brother had a history of issues. But from what I could see in the office, it was habitual. She already had jaw issues. She had bilateral popping and deviation at four years old. And what we notice is when she moved her lips, she had mandibular instability. So even at four years old, we're dealing with mandibular instability, which is leading to jaw issues already. When we do myofunctional evaluations with younger kids, I will set up a little video camera. I set up my phone on a tripod just so I can watch what they do. I want to watch what their mouth is doing. I want to watch how they're resting. So you can see here, this is her rest posture. It's outside of her mouth between her teeth. I look at their lip posture. So again, she's got that tension, which was really apparent in her smile in that picture. But this shows us she's got a really tense upper lip and then that lower lip is everted and sticking out. Let's look at Fiona's picture on the right. Do you see how retruded her mandible is at four? So she's still stuck in that pattern where that mandible is stuck. Here's her photos from inside her mouth. She was definitely tied. She had a vaulted palate. You can see those lower anteriors rotated from the, the pressure of the tie pulling that tissue in. So it pulls the teeth in, changes the way that they're erupting, and total lack of spacing. No spacing between those baby teeth. Here's her occlusion. She had an overjet, 100% overbite. She's got those teeth going up into her palate when she bites. Her lower jaw is totally trapped by her maxilla, and all of those teeth are tipping inward, just closing up that arch. Here's her tie, which she's a little bit devious. Like she looks, it's deceiving. She seems like her tongue has really good movement, but she's lifting the entire floor of her mouth. And when you look at the picture on the right, you can see the dimple in the middle of her tongue. That is a telltale sign the patients are tied and don't have good movement. Here's her clicking. You can see her jaw moving all over the place. Here's her snacking. So when you have kiddos that just keep shoving food in their mouth like this, that's another really big sign. She's chewing with her mouth open. They're falling out of her mouth. She's taking two chews and just swallowing that food. That is going to wreak havoc on these kids' digestive system. So even though she didn't have really any apparent tonsil issues that I could see, I sent her to an ENT because she had a brother who had tonsil issues. The tonsils were removed and his tonsils actually grew back. So I wanted her to have clearance from an ENT. She needed a little bit of body work. She needed myofunctional therapy. We wanted to do a CT scan so we could see her airway. 
We recommended releases of her tongue, her upper and lower lip, and we did end up doing her cheeks as well. And eventually expansion orthodontics if that was something that she was gonna need post-release. So in our myofunctional sessions, these are the things that we worked on. We really wanted to get jaw stability so we're not having that deviation and that instability that we saw. We wanted to work on her lips being strong. We have lots of things to work on with Fiona. But ultimately, she came in and had her phrenectomy evaluation, and she was really nervous, but she did such an amazing job. And this was her release. This is what she looked like one week post-op. So she's able to hold that cave. She's got it a little bit over her teeth, so it's not perfect, but she's getting there. For four years old, she really did an amazing job. We're going back to Fiona. So Fiona's mom and I got really close, and I said, I'd really love to see some photos of Fiona when she was younger. So look at Fiona at two. Is this something we could have helped Fiona with and not waited till she was four to help her? Look at her progression at three. She looked the same at three as she was at four. So we definitely could have intervened if we would have seen her. Here she is at three and a half, starting to get that really gummy smile. Maxilla is growing downward. Here she is at four. You can see how misshapen that palette is. She's getting really narrow. There she is when I saw her at four and a half. Here she is at her one week post-op that you just saw after her release. Here she is one month post-op with her Myo Munchie, which is something we use with a lot of our kids. Here she is two months post-op. Now, I really want you to take a look at our intervention. We did myofunctional therapy with her, and we did a tongue tie release. And the, the timeline, we started in September of 2020, and it's not even six months later that we finished with her, with her releases and her myofunctional therapy. And look at what a difference in her face that you can see. The facial tension is gone. Her smile looks totally different. She's wider, and we, ha we hadn't even done any expansion at that point for her. This is Fiona in expansion. Pictures are where she started. Those are the pictures that you saw with the, the tipping and the overjet, and the bottom is where she's at now. Nice and wide. Nothing is tipping. Everything is upright. She's got a nice, wide, big smile. So those are the wins that we want. So now my point of that is, is we could have started a lot earlier with Fiona if we, if we knew her and we were able to see her. So I, I want to go through just a couple case studies of younger kids that we've seen. So Evie is 17 months. She had gone for multiple opinions. She was 17 months old. Mom was still nursing her and Evie would not eat. Mom said she introduced salads at seven months, and she used to eat cheese, crackers, and potatoes consistently, but Evie now at 17 months has stopped eating food. So she takes no calories in for solid food. She will put the food in her mouth, she'll chew it, and she'll spit it out. Here's Evie's lip tie. Here's her tongue tie. So we obviously did releases on her. This is her post-op can lift her lips. She has better range of motion. There's her post-op for her tongue. And here she is the night of the procedure. Having fun? I don't know all these kids with tongue ties and lip uh, hey. It'll be fun. Just so that night eat. she was already eating more food. Oh, no. So, um, Here, me one second. Let me just remind everybody to please mute themselves. Exactly. And then she started saying new words. So it was amazing getting to treat Evie and being part of her care team. This is Everly. This is a patient that we just had recently. Mom came in. Everly's 11 months. 
through her intake, we found out that mom had a lot of issues nursing. She needed a nipple shield. She had a poor latch. So mom just gave up and switched to bottle feeding. Pediatrician looked at Everly, said she has no lip ties or cheek ties. Um, and referred her to a GI specialist. So Everly at 11 months old is on two medications for reflux. Mom tried to take a pause with the reflux medication and eat and Everly totally regressed in her feeding. She stopped feeding, eating any solids. So mom took her to see a feeding therapist, very spotty eating. So she referred her to us for an evaluation. In our evaluation, we went through her whole intake. We looked at her lip. You can see how low her lip is. She's got that chapping on her lip where it's kind of ripped open from her open mouth breathing. Here's her tongue. Here's her post-op. She can lift her lip better, her lip and her tongue. She's moving all that way better. This is her in the car right after the procedure holding a suction with a giant smile on her face. Look at her moving that tongue. So Everly's eating new food. She's eating avocado. She's eating scrambled eggs. She's eating pancakes. And Everly's mom at one week post-op told us Everly is now exploded one week post-op in her movement. She's standing up and cruising on furniture. She said mama for the first time, and she is just overall a happier baby. The last guy I wanna show you is Wyatt. He had lots of issues coming in. Mom had lots of issues nursing, you can see. He had seen a provider in January for releases, but all of his issues two months later are coming back. When we did his evaluation, mom had brought him to a chiropractor. She wasn't really happy. She said he would eat for two to five minutes and then want to eat again in 30 minutes because he was getting tired. He was mouth breathing and snoring as well. So we took a look at his ties. He was tied in both areas. When we did his body posture evaluation, this is what Wyatt looked like. He could not lay his head flat on the mat at all. That was his body posture. So we did not do any releases. We sent him out first for body work. So this is post body work. Even though he's not happy, his body's a lot happier because he's able to lay flat and not be hanging up in the air from the tension release date after his body work. And here he is one week post-op. So he's spitting up more, which sometimes tells us that he's being more efficient eating, but he's going a lot longer between his feeds. So he's feeding less frequently, meaning he's able to go two hours between feeds instead of 30 minutes. So he's still building up the stamina in his tongue to be able to, you know, have longer feeds. At five months, we should be able to go a little bit longer but he's getting there. So my question is, what are we waiting for? Why, why are we waiting? We know these things are going to be detrimental. We know that ties are going to totally inhibit them from being able to move. So we need to really get on track looking at these kids earlier. And what could this look like in your office? You know, as dental professionals, what can we do to really help these kids? So we know what the ADA says, the child's first dental visit should take place after the first tooth appears, but no later than the first birthday. And the American Academy of Pediatric Dentistry agrees. These babies need to be getting in. They even came up with a giant chart of what we should be counseling parents on. We know we have a dental code that we can charge out as well to help see these parents and guide parents to know what to expect and how to help their kids grow as best as they can be. And this is what's included. So talking to parents about what to expect, what's coming, how to choose a proper toothpaste for your child, how to choose the proper pacifier, how to take care of oral hygiene. Oral hygiene starts before teeth even come in getting kids desensitized and knowing what toothbrushing is, talking about growth and development, 
excuse me, talking about nutrition, how to minimize the risk of tooth decay and talking about teething developmental milestones. There's a giant list that we can be talking to parents about. And who else is really looking in the mouth? I mean, from what I know, you know, when my kids were little, we would go to the pediatrician all the time. We would go for these milestone visits and they're, they're weighing the kids and checking their length and, and making sure they're on track. But Who's making sure that their mouths are on track? Who's looking in their mouth to make sure that, you know, everything's on track so they can breathe well and sleep well and eat and do all the things that they need to do. So we came up with, in our office, a milestone screening for the dental office. So we do milestone checkups for kids. We do consultations for moms prenatally while they're expecting. And then when their babies are born through three years, we have them in for visits. We give them a goodie bag with a tool to take home and use. And we talk to them about what to expect for their patient or their for their babies, my patients, for what to expect while they're growing and developing. So these are the milestone screenings that we do in our office through our mini sprouts program. Again, we start prenatally and we go from birth to three. These are the overall tenants that we're talking about with parents. So breathing, oral posture, dental development, sleeping, movement, and nutrition. So just to give you like a little taste of what we're talking to parents about, Again, we're going over breastfeeding, bottle feeding, pacifiers, good rest posture, um, understanding why they might be mouth breathing and what they can do with their babies at home. You know, babies so early will start mimicking their parents. So we can teach parents how to teach them to blow raspberries, blow bubbles, make silly faces, click their tongue. There's all kinds of things that you can do with babies and they will mock you and do exactly what you're doing. So starting with our tenants, starting with breathing, we are screening all of our kids. One of the things we out again is open mouth breathing versus closed mouth breathing. And which do you think is most important? Obviously we want closed mouth breathing. We want these kids to be having their mouth closed, breathing through their nose. We know that's what's most beneficial with nitric oxide and better orient better environment for their mouth, better for their teeth. That's what we need to have. We need to educate parents why that's so important too. Oral posture. So we screen for oral posture. Does your child have low tongue posture or is their tongue to palate at rest? This baby mouth wide open when they're interacting, that's different. But when they're resting, that tongue needs to be at the palate at rest. When they're sleeping, that tongue needs to be at the palate for sleep, for naps and overnights. The next thing we talk about is dental development. We'd like to educate parents about palates. You know, what's the difference between a vaulted or very narrow palate versus a low and wide palate? Why is this palate going to affect so many things with their child as opposed to this palate? We want those low wide palates for them to have great airway structure, be able to breathe better, be able to have a great setup for their teeth to come in. So this is the goal. And how do we get there? That's what we help parents with too, how to get to these good things. Body posture. We talk to parents a lot about tummy time, especially with infancy. Uh, we see a lot of infants that are tongue tied and because their tongue is attached all the way throughout their body, babies who have tongue ties do not like tummy time. So they struggle. Either they cry in tummy time or they're in pain. And we need to help them get comfortable because that's what we want, comfortable tummy time for them to be there. This is how they're going to build their muscles and really be able to meet all their milestones and get through all the things that they need to do. So we're talking to parents, you know, post-releases, are we having improvements with feeding or are we not having any improvements? So we want to screen and see that they're having improved bottle or breastfeeding. Sometimes they don't need tongue tie releases. Sometimes they need a different bottle nipple for them to be able to manage it better in their mouth. Sometimes it's really simple. And then we talk about sleep. So we want to ask parents, do they have unnatural head postures and are they snoring 
or they very neutral head posture and quiet breathing. So of course, this is what we want. We want neutral head posture, quiet breathing, lips closed, tongue up, nose breathing. That's beautiful. So if you're interested, I put together that all of that section in a guide. If you scan this QR code, if you take a picture with your phone, um, you'll be able to go right to that section and it will give you like a full sheet so you can have a checklist for your office for a little piece of mini sprouts in your office to see what we do. The other big part of mini sprouts is educating parents and then referring. So collaboration is huge. We need to be able to identify the problems early and either intervene in the dental office or know where we can refer patients out if needed. And this is really going to help set them up, obviously, for ideal oral growth and development, but overall wealth or healthiness and wellness. And that's what we're looking for with our kids. So what kind of collaborations do we do with other professionals? We need to know where to send these kids for problems that we see that we don't specialize in. So obviously, if we're seeing a kid like that poor baby that couldn't lay flat, we're sending to chiropractic, we're sending to craniosacral, we're sending to physical therapy, whatever they need for body work. We have IBCLCs that we're referring our, our patients to. IBCLCs can also special in bottle feeding, so it's not always necessarily just breastfeeding. They can help with nipples and oral function as well sometimes. And then sometimes kids need occupational or feeding therapy, speech and language pathologists who specialize in feeding therapy. These are the, the specialists that can help our kids who are having feeding issues. So what kind of things are we going to see? You know, what are the infant impacts? What are the toddler impacts? They're going to eat better. They're going to sleep better. The babies are going to gain more weight. They're going to have the flexibility in their body to meet their milestones. Um, toddlers are going to be able to talk better. Um, it's just going to be overall better quality of life for these kids. So my question for us, especially being in a dental field, like how are we preventing things if we aren't screening and educating, starting with infants? Because if we aren't starting with infants, then it's kind of being pushed off until we're a toddler. And if we don't see it when they're a toddler, then we're school age and there's problems. And if we don't really address it then, then we're teenagers and then we're adults and then we're elderly. And, you know, every group is going to be dealing with different issues. So if we start young, we're going to be able to intervene and help way more than just waiting. So I love this quote because you are not responsible for what you say, but also for what you do not say. And sometimes you don't know better. Sometimes, you know, what's really intimidating to see these younger kids in our office, but I will tell you, parents are so hungry for this information and they want to know and understand what's happening with their kids. So they appreciate any education that you can give them to help make their, their baby or toddler healthier. So if anyone is interested, I do teach a course, Baby Mouse and Toddler Mouse. It has a lot of information. It's like a really deep dive. Um, if you're interested, you can either scan the code here or you can go to levelupmyo.com. It's the baby mouth, toddler mouth course. And I put up a discount code that will be good for the next two weeks. So you can use the discount code IAOMT. That will be good till April 15th. And it'll give you a pretty good discount on that course if you're interested in learning a lot more of all the connections with these things together. If you're a dental office and you want to learn more about the mini sprouts method and how we structure our appointments with kids, we do train other dental offices on this model. So we will teach you everything you need to know to help infants and toddlers in your office. So you don't ever have to be intimidated when you see these kids on your schedule. You'll know exactly what to do. And we help you every single step of the way to guide you. And that is the end of the presentation. I put my um, information up here. I work in an office in Illinois here. 
Um, it's called Inspired Dental Wellness. We do all kinds of things. We do TMJ treatment. We do phrenectomies. I'm the in-house myofunctional therapist and lactation consultant. Um, we do airway orthodontics there. So it's really a unique practice. Um, if you have any questions, you can certainly email me. I have both my emails on there. You can contact me anywhere if you have further questions about anything I put in the presentation. And that's the end. This was wonderful. Thank you so much for, for having you, me. Joy. That was wonderful. It's just seeing what we can do with our littlest littles um, before everything starts to go downhill is so important. Yeah, exactly. So I appreciate your outstanding presentation. Um, we Thank had you. A, a couple of questions. Um, what pacifiers do you recommend? Sure. So good question. I do like the Soothe pacifiers. I like them for kids who are having issues learning how to function with their tongue because it's a harder pacifier. They have to learn how to cup their tongue around that pacifier. They have to learn how to, um, they have sometimes need suck training after they have tongue tie releases. So I do like the Soothe's, but that's more of a therapeutic pacifier. I really like the Ninny pacifiers. They're very um, flexible, but they're very wide and it makes the baby open really big to be able to latch on to that. So that's my favorite. We have a lot of moms in that are nursing and they're using the flat pacifiers, like the orthodontic pacifiers, the, the Nook or the MAM. And the babies are just chomping on those pacifiers. And then when they go to latch the baby and breastfeed them, they're chomping on mom. So it, the patterning follows. So that's why I like the ninny. So say that again, ninny, N-I-N-I -I or M-I-N? It's, it's N-I-N-N-I. N-I-N-N-I. -N -N -I. Excellent. Thank you. Yep. Good. All right. And then Caroline asked um, if we're able to share your version of the intake questionnaire you have outlined. So I put in the QR code, it's all like put together for you in a, in a um, questionnaire. So you can print that out and use it with parents and patients. Um, obviously it's just like a superficial layer of like stuff we went over today. Um, in the mini sprouts program, we go through each um, milestone and we have like for each age group. So obviously if you're seeing a child who's three months, you're going to have a different checklist than if you have a child who's a year and a half, right? They're going to be eating things and it's just different. So the checklists are all different. Excellent. I think we had one, one more question. Let me see if I can find it. If there's any other questions, please put them in the chat. Um, Let me see if I can pull up that QR code again. I know someone okay, was asking for it. Excellent. So this is the QR code for the course. If you're interested, levelupmyo.com. And let me find the QR code for the guide. There it is. All right. And then Jess asked, do you see clients first or someone in your dental part of your office? Um, so in our office, how we have it structured is I see everybody first, and then the doctor will come in and do an exam, and we will together kind of figure out what's going to be the best place for them to go to first. Obviously, some babies, if they're having a really hard time laying on those mats, we're not doing anything with those babies. Those babies are not comfortable within their own skin, so they go see body workers first. Um, if babies are gagging and choking and they can't tolerate anything, they're going to see feeding therapists first. Um, so every patient gets the same screening, but they're kind of filtered out to different places to get the support that they need. Okay, thank you. Um, sure. Are there any other questions? We have answered all of your questions today. <laughs> so that is outstanding. All right, so thank you everyone for coming. And um, if you have any more questions, um, you know, you have Joy's email address and then you can also message me and I can contact her. So um, thank you everyone for coming today. Thank you so much, Joy, for- Sure, thanks again Joy. for having me.
you had such great information. It was amazing. I just, I love seeing it. Great. And, you know, to know that we can make a difference, you know, in a, in a newborn, in a three month old, in a six month old and not wait. We sure can. Four years old. I mean, look back in your Esther Wilkins book, Hygienist here, you have an entire chapter. We, we learned about all this stuff. So it is definitely in scope. It is. It is. All right. Thank you, everyone. And I am so glad to see all of you here. Enjoy again. Thank you so much. Of course. Have a great weekend, everyone. All righty.